But now in part two, I spent uh, quite a few hours on this, but I wanted to give you the two or three minute summary on the life and times of Kareem Garcia. Steve, you're going to be blown away by how much history goes into this man's career. Are you both ready? Well, yeah. before you start, yes. like, and you can attest to this, is like, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you're doing this. I, I really am because this is what this show is all about. This show is not about you. It's not about me. It's about the journey or the chosen journey. And the people that we have on here are special people who have special journeys. And you're about to lay out the journey of Kareem Garcia and his 24 years in uh, the baseball world that people should hear because it's a testament to Kareem that he was able to stay healthy. He was able to stay in shape. He was able to play this game for 24 years, which everybody would love to do. Unfortunately, some a little bit shorter. I can't name too many people besides like Jamie Moyer and somebody else that was a little bit longer. But uh, Bartolo. You know, I just wanted to get that. Yeah, Bartolo. I just wanted to get it out and say, I'm really happy that you're doing this because it's just a, a tribute to Kareem and the length of his career and, and what he's able to accomplish. Amen. Amen. And we call this the chosen journey. This is a baseball odyssey. Like this is in the folklore that if you, if it didn't happen, you wouldn't believe this. Like you couldn't write a better script as far as a baseball life goes. You may have to correct my pronunciation on some stuff, but get ready for this one. So born in, this is how I pronounce it as me, Ciudad Obregón, Mexico. That's fine. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in the year 1975, went to high school in Mexico. Your mm -hmm. debut at 19, September 2nd, 1995, with the Dodgers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Career MLB, 95 to 2005. 95 to 97 with the Dodgers. In 1992, he signed as an amateur free agent with the Dodgers, in fact. I was wondering, how did he ever come to be? So, And we'll touch upon a lot of his stuff, but I wanted to list it off just so people can see how the, the chronological of the life of Kareem. First MLB home run was 97 with the Dodgers. In 97, the Diamondbacks selected you in the expansion draft. March 31st, 98, Diamondbacks' first MLB game. 92, 92 win against the Rockies. You batted sixth and got a home run. 98, traded to the Tigers for a guy by the name of Luis Gonzalez. He ended up having an okay uh, career, I think. 2004, last MLB season with the Orioles. So we had the D-backs, the Tigers, Orioles, Indians became the Guardians, Yankees, Mets, and the Orioles. Your finest season was in 2002, 16 home runs, 52 RBIs, 297 average, 889 OPS. Pretty nice numbers there. And he even got 10 career stolen bases. He snuck those in. In his <laughs> baseball world, the man wore very, very many numbers. 10, 12, 20, 24, 28, 29, 46, 47, 50, 57, and 95. He played all outfield positions plus first base. Total career in baseball was 93 to 2016, 24 years. 28 different baseball teams played in the majors, minors, Mexico, Japan, Korea. 533 total home runs across the board. 2,878 games. 10,000 at bats. 2,800 hits. 490 doubles. 275 average. 831 OPS. Now, here's my favorite thing of all. You didn't even take up baseball, apparently, until you were 13. Your father was a former baseball pitcher, and he saw the talent. And your favorite player, apparently, growing up was Fernando Valenzuela, who did coach you in Team Mexico WBC. <sighs> <sighs> wow. That's like five careers for five people, and that's all one person. <laughs> Kareem, when you hear that, does it still does it sink in, or does it feel like a dream? It feels like a dream, you know, because when you're playing, you're, you're playing. I play to have fun. I enjoy the game. I really enjoy the game every time I step to a plate or to the outfield. When I was in the outfield, I had the most fun. I wanted always that they hit the ball to me because I wanted to show my arm. I wanted to throw the ball as hard as I could to the bases. You know, that the whole nine yards. I, I love, you know, running around, playing with the guys, but playing the game the right way. And, you know, my dad, when he was a baseball player, he teach me to play the right way. He said, you play the right way or don't play at all. 
So either you give it everything you have or don't step to the field and disrespect the people that does. So I always try to do my best, you know, from the 100% that I have every day. Every day is different. You don't you don't feel the same way every day. So whatever I had that day, I will, I will give you my best. And I always did. And I mean, like you say, I was fortunate enough that I only got injured one time during my career. It was back in 1997. And I got a surgery on my shoulder. And I got arthroscopic surgery on my left shoulder, my throwing arm. So uh, it took me out for like three months out of the season in the off season, but I started working out hard. But when I went back to 98, they say, oh, you're not going to start the season. They say, you're kidding me, I'm ready to go. So by spring training, I was playing baseball back again. So I was, you know, thankful for that. It was a great uh, surgery. And after that, never got um, hurt again like that. I got to ask you, at 13, at what point from 13 on, when did you think you had a realistic chance of, of coming to the show, to getting signed by a Major League Baseball team and actually playing Major League Baseball? Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I, I didn't follow that much baseball besides watching Fernando Valenzuela, you know, because in Mexico that was the only thing they would do watch when he pitched. And I was a track runner. I was a track runner in, in the school. And... Um, because of that, I threw the javelin and the disc, so my shoulders were strong. So that that helps to play baseball, you know, the coordination of those two things with the 100 meters and the 400 meters I ran, you know, it held me out for, you know, my stamina, my, my, my strength. And when I started playing baseball, it's because I had a, a little fight with my coach in, uh, <laughs> in the school, and I said, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna run anymore. I'm gonna start playing baseball. He laughed at me. He was like, "Yeah, right. You're gonna be back over here in a month." And I started, you know, I, I cash and I threw, but I never put really attention. But because I ran track, I was able to make contact with the ball, run, stuff like that. I wasn't the best, believe me. I was the worst because when I started playing baseball, signed as a professional three years later, my first year in in able, I made. 21 uh, throwing errors. So I wasn't a good outfielder at all. I was still learning, learning everything. But I was putting attention. I was trying to soak as much as I can from whoever wanted to talk to me at the moment and try to, to learn. So from 13 to 16, I started playing baseball and I started getting better, you know, gradually and playing some tournaments in Mexico. And finally, the Dodgers came to see me. And that's when I signed with them. Amazing. And, uh, and, and and your father, having pitched himself, did he ever try to push you at a younger age to take it up, or he left it for you to decide? Uh, my, my dad was an outfielder, but he never pushed myself or any uh, of my brother. He never wanted us to play baseball because he knew this a small percentage of people that can actually make it to the major leagues. you know. And, and he knows what it takes living – on the minor leagues, it's not a life, believe me. It's, it's really difficult. It's not money to be made. You have to play really hard. You have to be really young. If you have a family. It's definitely not a life you want for your family. So uh, that's why my dad didn't want me to play baseball because, you know, it's only 1% out of the 10,000 guys that, that sign every year. They're going to make it to the major leagues. And he knew that. And, and what was your dad's reaction when you did make the major leagues? <laughs> He was ecstatic. I mean, he couldn't believe it. He was so happy. They, uh, the Dodgers did actually something really nice. They called me up on uh, August 31st, uh, 1995, and they sent two tickets, two plane tickets from my parents in uh, Obregon to fly to Obregon, Phoenix, Phoenix, Los Angeles. And they went to see me, my debut in September 2nd over there, my first at bat ever. So... They did something really amazing, and and I was very grateful to them uh, for doing that. Those are two at bats that I wanted to mention. The first one being the first ever at bat with the Dodgers walking onto a major league field. You know, can you do you remember vividly, or was it like a dream, like it went by in an instant? No, I, I can remember very well because I was sitting uh, in the bench talking to uh, Juan Castro, another Mexican, you know, shortstop. He was playing with me at that moment good friend of mine, and um, we were talking, uh, I don't remember what we were talking about, but it's Jeff Facero pitching, a left-hander, you know, from Montreal. 
And I say, well, I'm not going to get an at bat. I'm lefty. I'm a rookie. And Tommy is not going to send me my first at bat. Yeah, right. He goes, hey, Garcia, you're up. And I turn around. I'm like, he is a like Garcia. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> lefty on lefty. You know, I never had problems lefty on lefty. But my first major league at bat against a veteran guy. And, and Fasero was a, a complete gentleman. He went and threw only fastballs to me. Fastball right down the middle. Hit it, hit it, hit it. And I keep missing it, keep missing it. Finally, take a pitch right on the middle, strike three, strike out. I was like, oh, my God. Well, that was my first at-bat, and I can remember perfectly. And how did that compare to walking to an expansion team, getting drafted onto an expansion team, and then playing the first home game ever for this team and hitting a home run in their first game? This is, is different. You know, I was happy to be part of the new team of the Arizona Diamondbacks, and like you mentioned, it's a suspension team. So you know, I mean, your chances to make it to the playoff is going to be very difficult. You have some good veteran guys on that team, but most of us were very young guys. You know, yes, getting our, our feet wet in the major leagues. You know, I was 21 years old at the time. And um, I was happy. I was very thankful to uh, Buckshaw Walter. He tried to um, help me as much as he could, you know, as a manager. And... Uh, I should have listened a little more sometimes or put attention a little more what he said. But, you know, as a 21-year-old kid, you know, because you're still a kid at that moment, uh, you think you know everything and you don't know really nothing, you know. But there's nothing like your first major league game. That's correct. Nothing compared to No matter to what it. it is. There's nothing like the first time you step on a major league field as a rookie – and reflect on all of the hard work that you put in, no matter how long it takes to get there, because that's the pinnacle of what guys like Kareem, myself, and and many other players strive for when you either get drafted or signed as a free agent or anything like that. So the first games, I, I would say, is like everybody remembers their first game, their first at bat, their first pitch, all of that stuff. And do you want to hear my comp for you, Kareem? Mm -hmm. I've I've seen play. Okay, so my comp for you and Jonathan, I don't know, probably wouldn't even know, is Alex Verdugo. <laughs> oh, so yeah. to me, is you guys, that's like the is is when I watch him play, that brings me back to like who you were and how you played the game. Yeah, he's a red nose guy. He plays hard. Yeah. Yes. yes, he does. Mm -hmm. I, I like, I like, I like the way he plays. And now it's making more sense knowing the track star. I did, I, you see, I threw in the ten stolen bases. I didn't even know about the track star thing, and you did get <laughs> ten stolen bases in your major league career. Uh, did you have like, thoughts of being a Ricky Henderson, Vince Coleman, or did you always know you wanted to be an outfielder? Did you ever think about pitching because you were doing javelin? Like, how did you come to find your positioning as a hitter and in the field? I, I love uh, hitting the ball. I, I, I always wanted to be a hitter. I actually tried to hit both uh, right-hander, left-hander, you know, switch hitter. Uh, but I never had the uh, problems facing lefty on lefty. Actually, I think I hit better lefties than I hit righties in my career. And uh, the other thing, uh, I had a good arm. And in Japan, this is a funny story because I was, you know, yes, in, in uh, spring training, I grabbed the ball, I get to the mound just like, a lot of us do it, you know, and I start throwing some balls to home plate. And he go, okay, let it go. And I think I hit 154 kilometers, which is like 95, 96. And my coach was like, hey, did you pitch? I say, hell no, I don't pitch. <laughs> and you've never been brought into a game at any level as a pitcher, right? Never, never, I never pitch. I always and thought they, maybe in a blowout, me. maybe they brought him in. I couldn't find any stats showing that you ever pitched one pitch ever no. on any level. So never. then that answers that one question. Number two, all these numbers, did did the team just issue the numbers or do you ever have a preference for the numbers that you wore? The uh, the 95 that I used probably the last 10 years of my career is because I made it to the major leagues in 1995. That's what that meant. That's what that means to me. The 95. The number 12 the, the, that I started with the Dodgers, that's the number that my dad uh, used in Mexico to play baseball. So when I signed my contract in 1991 with the Dodgers, 
they put in a stipulation that if I make it to the major leagues, I wanted to use number 12. And believe it or not, when I got to the major leagues, number 12 was on my locker. I was so happy that nobody had it and they gave it to me that I couldn't believe it because I was honoring my dad. And then uh, when I got to the Diamondbacks, number 12 was taken by, I, I can't remember who was, but it said 12 and 12 was 24. So my dad was 12, I was 12, 24, I, I used 24. There and that's go. why I used number 24. I remember you was 10 or 24 usually. So the 24 yeah. makes sense, two times 12. Yep. And then from there, knowing how you get the numbers, Picture your career, looking at everywhere you've been. Were you one of those players that always had their passport and their suitcase ready to go at the door no matter what? Yes. Yes. After <laughs> I got traded a couple of times, I was I knew I was ready for whatever. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not always fun when you get traded from one team to another. Uh, but at least you know that someone wants you more than the team that you want, you, you are. And uh, for me, when I got traded from Cleveland to New York, was a little bit difficult, not only because I like all the guys in the team and I had a lot of fun, but because I just bought a house in Cleveland that year. Mm. <laughs> that really hurts. <laughs> so, no, I can imagine. Well, and I've always wondered, you know, do guys collect the houses in each of the cities? Maybe now they do with the salaries, but back then people sold their houses and bought new houses, right? Yes, exactly. Kareem, when you sit in the off season and watch some of these dollars flying for some of these players and uh, you look going back and look at your stats, a prime Kareem Garcia being available as a free agent right now, do you ever calculate those dollars? <laughs> no, I really don't because, I mean, uh, my era was different. And, and that's what happened. The guys on the 80s can reflect on the guys on the 90s and, and so mm -hmm. on. You know, I, I cannot live on the, on the future. I live on, on, on whatever I play. And I'm happy what I did, and I'm happy what I got. You know, I cannot reflect on the on the rest of it. And uh, summing up this part of the, and then we're going to move to WBC for the last part. But uh, I found it fascinating. Mexico makes sense in that, uh, from your nationality standpoint, how did you find your way to Korea and Japan? Was that the team seeking you out? Did you seek it out through an agent? And how did you find those experiences internationally? When I was uh, playing with the Yankees in 2003, um, I have a Hideki Matsui. So Hideki Matsui uh, didn't spoke a lot of English, but he has a translator. So all the time I was asking him questions about how was the baseball in Japan. He was the Godzilla over there, you know, the big uh, home run hitter. He said, yeah, I think your stadium's over there smaller than over here because you only hit 20 home runs here and you hit 55 over there. So I was giving, you know, stuff. I, I was funny, no disrespectful whatsoever, you know. That's why he liked me. And he is probably one of the guys that put my name in Japan when, say, if you ever want to go to Japan and you're really serious, I can probably, you know, call a couple teams. And actually when I did my tryout was the Yomuri Giants and the Buffalo Oryx. And I did my tryout in Yankee Stadium. So out of those two teams, uh, Buffalo had the best offer and I went with them. There you go. And Korea? In Korea, I was um, finished spring training in 2007 with Philadelphia. And uh, after having, I had a good spring training. And they say, you know what, uh, we need a third baseman outfielder. How about you go to the minor leagues for a couple months and then we call you back up. And I was like, I'm a little too old now to go to AAA, you know. I'm taking a spot for another guy. So I went to Mexico to play for the few, uh, the few months over there. Ended up winning the championship in Mexico, and a Korean team came and offered me a contract. So the, after the, the year that I played in Mexico in 2007, I went to, to Korea for four years. And if you had to do a summary of playing in, in the States, Mexico, Korea, Japan, as a professional baseball player, what could you say as far as similarities, differences that stick out most in your mind from your experiences? You know, Asia is completely different than the United States and Mexico, by far. And I'm talking by far because uh, the uh, the amount of uh, spring training they take, we would say six weeks in the States. They take two and a half months in, 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 in Asia. So it's, it can be cold, it can be raining, and you're still working out no matter what. And and I think that you overdo it, and that's why they got some guys get injured because 
you know, they, they stress a lot and they put a lot of stress into those those players. They try to be a little nicer or lighter on the on the foreign players, but I mean they are crazy. Like in the States, if I need extra hitting, I'll tell one of my coaches in spring training, hey, I need a, a little more hitting. So they get someone, I get another 10, 15 minutes hitting. If the coach in, in Asia sees you in Japan or Korea, that you're not hitting the ball good, he goes, hey, you got one hour, 30 minutes against the lefty, 30 minutes against the righty. Hour hitting, you know how many swings are those? That's impossible to count. It's probably three, 400 swings in an hour. And because they saw you in, uh, in practice, you're not hitting the ball well. And that can happen every other day, and they run you to death. Of course, by the, mm-hmm. by the time the season starts, I mean, you're, you're strong as a bull or you're tired, either or. But you are something <laughs> in between. Steve, can you imagine North America, your son who's 12, uh, being put through coaching like this? Like, there'd be lawsuits flying if they're trying to make the kids do this much work. No doubt. I mean, but it's just a different style of baseball. That's the way they've been brought up. That's the way they teach it. That's the way they do it, as opposed to, you know, North American baseball, Mexico, Canada, United States. It's just uh, it's just a little bit different philosophy of, of how they, you know, practice with their players and teach their players and, um, you know, do the things that they want to do when they're on the field. 